Okay, so I second that we start now. Sorry for this delay. Don't forget to sign up to your phone. And so have to see a second lecture of the best technology in the world. Yes. So, um, in my first lecture, I was talking about uh, statistical properties of networks, both the statistical properties of networks in the brain as well as statistical properties of, of other networks. And what we'll be talking about today is how one can model such networks. And typically, this is done using non track models, and there are lots of different models out there. And I'll be trying to illustrate what models might be good models for the brain and what one can do. All right. So, when we model networks, we typically use random graphs. And random graphs are, are used to um, describe the uncertainty uh, in whether they have connections between elements or not. So that's what we use randomness for. I mean, we do know that, for example, in the brain, the neuron can make lots of connections, but it's not certain that a neuron that is in a certain place will make a connection to a neuron even when it's close by. It's more likely to make a connection to a neuron that is close by, but it doesn't always do it. It has a fixed number of, uh, 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 average number of connections to give, and the further the neurons are away, the smaller the probability of making that connection becomes. So one way of modeling this uncertainty is by using random data, by using randoms. Now when we talk about uh, network models, uh, there are two perspectives that are uh, both useful, um, but say something different. So first there is the static setting, and in the second setting, we're thinking about the network as a given, it's fixed, and we investigate its properties. So we take where it has a fixed size, uh, the, uh, the edges that are there are people meeting there, and, and that's it. So we fix the size, we fix, for example, the number of edges, or, or the probabilistic rules behind them, and that will give us uh, the graph. Now, in, in reality, Many of the networks are actually changing over time, and many of them are actually growing. So if you think, for example, about Facebook, then more and more people are uh, becoming uh, members of Facebook, and also their number of friends typically increases. So that's a dynamic model, where as time progresses, you think about the networks changing over time. And this perspective can also be very useful because it might allow you to describe how the local rules that give rise to the, uh, the network rules can explain some of the local problems that you see. For example, the, the variation in the conductivity uh, that you observe. Welcome. So, um, I will describe a number of models uh, in these uh, in these settings. Both the models that have been uh, investigated a lot in the random graph community, but also some of the models that have been specifically designed in order to model the brain. Um, so the, the model that I will be focusing on the set, in the second setting is what is called the configuration model. I'll explain in more detail what this is, and uh, a model that is uh, that has been investigated a lot in the dynamic setting is what is called the preferential attachment model. Yesterday we already heard some things about that, but I will describe that in, uh, in more detail. Now, one of the things that you should bear in mind is that there is a lot of models, I sometimes call it the jungle. There is a lot of models that all try to describe. Essentially the same thing. And we have different models trying to model the same thing. You would hope that also these models have similar properties. Because if they don't, you don't really know which model you should trust. If I have two models for how water boils, and one predicts something and another predicts something else, that's not a good sign, because then you don't really know what is going to happen in reality. Now this is a feature that is very common in, in uh, models in physics. And what they call this is universality. What you, what you hope for is that if you look at, let's say, different models sharing a similar characteristics, that they also have similar problems. For example, in terms of their path rate or their cluster rate and more. So this is, this is a feature that uh, we will also talk about today. And this is particularly important because there are so many models around. So it becomes a sort of, it's difficult to understand which model would be good. And that is, you would hope that actually it doesn't really matter that much which model, which precise model we use. 
Now that's true to a certain extent, and it's false to another extent, so let me give some examples of that. Alright, so the very simplest model that you can come up with to model the random graph is what is called the average mean random graph. And this is a description of it, despite the fact that this description was actually invented by Gilbert and not by Eric Zerini. This is sometimes called the binomial model. So what you have is you have a vertex set, and if I have a static model with a fixed number of vertices, I will always denote the number of vertices by n, and this n between square brackets is a set from 1 up to n. Okay. So these are the elements. N is my network size. How many elements do I have in my network? And now I still have to describe how they are connected to one another. So I have to describe the probabilistic rules with which an edge is being formed between two verses. And the simplest thing you can imagine is that you say that for every pair of vertices, this connection is formed completely independently and with equal probability. That's a probabilistic rule, and it's a completely egalitarian rule. Every vertex and even every edge plays the same role. Okay? So that's what is being described here. So that's the simplest imaginable model of the round graph. But it's an interesting model. For example, if you think about P being a half, so every edge is there equally likely, then actually what the result is, is a uniform graph. So it's a, it's a graph picked uniformly out of the collection of all possible graphs with n verses. Now with P is a half, what you will see is that if the network is extremely large, on the average you will have roughly n over 2 uh, edges per vertex. So that's sometimes called the dense setting where the, the degree of, of vertex grows linearly in uh, the number of vertices that you have. Now that's simply not what we observe in real life networks. So for example, to, to think about the brain, um, the brain has of the order of 10 to the power of 11 vertices. You know, if P would be a half, that would mean that every neuron would be connected to one out of two uh, neurons that is there, so the average degree would be 10 to the power of 11 divided by 2. Well, we know that in reality it's more of the order than to the power of 4. So that means that that amount of this dense setting is not very realistic. So that's why we introduced this parameter P that actually allows us to decrease the number of edges that we see in that graph. And if we want to have a graph that has an average degree that is not too large, it actually means that we'll have to pick this P as a function of N. And typically what we then do is that we take a P that is a constant over n. So I often denote that constant by log. And then this means that the average degree is roughly log. Now why, why do I write roughly? Well actually the average degree is a random variable. So what kind of a random variable is it? Well, for every edge, I do an experiment independently of one another and with a fixed probability. So actually, if I look at the total number of edges, this has a binomial distribution. Right? The binomial distribution is what you get if you do a lot of experiments independently of one another with a fixed probability of success. Now, how many experiments do I do here? Well, I do an experiment for every edge. So how many edges are there? Well, n choose 2. That's the same thing as n times n minus 1 over 2. And then the second thing in the binomial distribution is the probability of a success. Now, in this case, that would be p. So in this case, that would be log n divided by n. Right. So the total number of edges is random. And the average degree is just this random thing divided through by n. Actually multiplied by 2. Okay? Now when n is very large, this is highly concentrated, so it will be very close to the mean. And its mean is, well in this case, n minus 1 times lambda divided by 2. So the mean number of edges, or the average number of edges, is very close to n times lambda divided by 2. Now since every edge is counted twice, because it's, it's instant two different vertices, it means that the, uh, 
if you look at the average degree, you have to divide through by n because you're averaging over the number of vertices, so you have to divide by the number of vertices, and you have to multiply by 2 because every edge is being counted one. Right? So this says that the average degree is roughly this number. Right? So by, by choosing your p in this way, and by varying like that, you can actually change the average degree. So if you want to apply this to the brain, it's of course a very simplistic model, which is not going to be a correct description for the brain. Ah, but if you would want this, and we believe in this number of the average degree being 10 to the power 4, 10,000, you would have to take love to 10,000. You know, the best possible. Yeah? So that's somehow how we think about models. So bear in mind what the difference is between this approach and the approach that I, uh, uh, that I talked about uh, earlier in my first lecture. So in my first lecture, I was talking about empirical graph properties. We were not modeling anything. And now we're actually writing down mathematical models that are aimed to describe or explain um, how the network comes to be uh, how it is. So as soon as we start mathematical modeling, we can also uh, make predictions about what happens when the graph size decreases, or what happens when the average degree changes, or this kind of thing. As soon as you want to do predictions, you have to have a model. Without a model, no predictions. Is that clear? Good. So this is the simplest possible model. Now, it's very interesting because it's closely related to the probabilistic method. So this model, for example, is used to prove that graphs of certain properties exist. So the proof of that is very simple. You can prove that in the area of any random graph, a graph has a certain property of positive probability. Well, then in this case, then there has to be one. It's, it's a bit of a weird uh, uh, a structure of proof, because you're trying to prove something which is deterministic by using a random, uh, a random variables. So this is something that's called the probabilistic method. So to use randomness in order to say something about deterministic quantities. And we'll see another example a little later on. So this is actually what the area is well known for, for the probabilistic method, and you want to be inventive of it. And uh, uh, this model has been uh, investigated uh, a lot since the early 60s, actually not really having network models in mind. That only came later, around 2000. There you go. Okay, so it's completely egalitarian. That means that all the vertices and even all the edges play the same role. The statistical properties of all the vertices are the same. Now, that's not what we typically see in our real world networks, because what we see there is a huge amount of variability between the number of connections that the different elements make. So, in this respect, this is not a problem. Okay. All right. But it is a useful model, and uh, that sometimes goes under the name of the known model. So, suppose you have a real world network, and we would like to investigate whether that real world network um, is completely random. It's coming from a completely random uh, process, or whether there's some sort of structure in, in what the connections are like. Now, completely random could be interpreted as saying that um, it's an area really random graph. But of course, when you do that, you would again take this uniform uh, area, a uniform graph, and that has to high identity typically. So, what we now instead do is that we fix the number of edges. I have my real world network, I look at how many edges I have there, I look at how many vertices I have there, and I want to compare that network to a network that has the same number of edges, the same number of vertices, but otherwise it's completely random. So you can do that using what is the real area training on the graph, it's actually the model that Eric already proposed, and that is the model where you start um, on the complete graph, and you choose your edges, fixed number, uniformly at random without a replacement. So it's almost the same. It's sort of the same if you were to condition this binomial random variable to take on a fixed value. Then actually they're precisely the same. But probabilistically they're also quite similar. Uh, that can be proved. And you should really think of the, uh, the value of p um, that should be related to the number of edges in your graph, which is this little m, in the following way. So if you do it this way, for this p, actually the expected number of edges will be roughly n. Right? And this actually is a relation that can be precise. So if you do this, then actually this, this new model 
there's no binomial model, the real electric and graph, radiates a uniform graph out of the direction of all graphs for which the total degree, the, the total number of edges is precisely equal to n. So that we can then compare to the real world network, for example, by looking at clustering or functions or whatever, whatever you're interested in, and if it's very different, then the conclusion that you can draw is that the graph that you're interested in, the real world network that you're interested in, is different from being random. So there's some sort of underlying structure there where some edges are more prevalent than you would expect on the basis of random training random graph, whereas other edges might be less prevalent on the basis of the comparison to the random graph. So it gives you a, a benchmark to compare. Yes? How do you escape output coincidence? Ah, it, it's a complex question. So I have a huge collection of edges that I could possibly draw. Right. So I draw one. In my next row, am I allowed to draw this one again or not? So if it is allowed, then you call this with replacement. If it isn't allowed, you call it without replacement because you, have, you can think of it as being a huge bag of edges that you put in a hat. And you draw something out of the hat and then you put it away. You don't put it back. So that's why, why it's called without replacement. Actually, the two are very similar. In this, uh, in this setting. All right. Um, so this is a random random graph can be seen as a benchmark model to compare real world networks to, and that's what I call a no model. Of course, it's 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 very. I mean, the only thing that you're fixing now is total number of edges. You may be, you may want to fix more in the graph, and then you get a different class of no models. Yeah, so we'll get back to that. It's not for nothing called the no model one. Now, there are many extensions that you can do to air training run graphs. You can make the edges in homogeneous, for example, or you can look at directed uh, versions of it. In some applications, it's more natural to look at directed graphs. In some uh, uh, examples, it's more natural to look at undirected graphs. Is it clear what the distinction is between a directed and an undirected graph? Who does not know? Good. So, I have two vertices, and I call them I and J. So what I think, you think about is some sort of a friendship or some sort of a connection. So for example, in Facebook, what happens is that this individual sends out a friendship request to the other one, and the other one accepts it, and then you draw an edge between them. But in some cases, I might think of J as a friend, whereas J does not think of I as a friend. Life is tough. Um, but it could also be that uh, here you're now thinking about I and J as being neurons. And now, of course, there is a, a, a big difference between this one sending out an action that connects to a dendrite here, or this one sending out an action that connects to a dendrite there. Okay? So then what we do is we draw a, a pointed edge. So this says that this one is connected to that one, but this one is not connected to that. So somehow, in terms of information flow, if this individual would know a rumor, he will tell it to his friend, but if this one has a rumor, he will not tell it to his friend. Okay. Now in some cases in the directed setting, you could actually have both of them, and then actually communication goes both ways. But it's a way of thinking about communication flowing one way or another. Huh? All right. Now the second model that I would like to discuss is what is called the configuration model. It basically is again the same setting. We fix the number of edges, or we fix the number of vertices, and we would like to describe uh, the probabilistic laws that govern the, uh, the edges that are there. Now one of the things that I've described previously is that in many network models, the number of connections per individual in the network varies uh, substantially. Now that's something that is not true in the area of the network. If you look at the description, the number of edges from an individual will be a binomial random variable with certain parameters. And in my setting that I've chosen here, this binomial distribution will be very close to a Poisson distribution, and the mean will be not that. And we know about Poisson distributions that they're very good and not very large. So in, in the rain, lambda should be around 10,000, and that means that the population is roughly the, the square root. So it's 10,000 plus or minus roughly 100. That's not a big amount of variation. And that's simply not what we see in real world networks, where uh, many of the individuals have a low degree, but you have these rare individuals which have very high degree. 
and you will never be able to get that out of an energy. So, that's related to the scale free behavior, there's no typical scale, and in the energy you run about there really is a typical scale, and the typical scale is lot so how can one go about this, this problem? Well, one thing that you could do is when you have your real-world network, it has a certain degree sequence, and that just means that every vertex has a degree, and you can write it down as a vector. Vertex 1 has a degree D1, vertex 2 has a degree D2, vertex 3 has a degree D3, etc. So that will give you a vector with an integer value for every vertex in the problem. That's called the degree sequence. Now, instead of somehow randomizing everything, I could keep this fixed. And then I would get a model where every vertex has precisely the same degrees as in the real world network that I'm achieving this. So now I'm fixing much more. I'm not just fixing the number of edges, but I'm actually fixing the number of edges per vertex for every vertex. That's much more information, so it's much more restricted. So it could be that the model actually looks a lot more like a real world model that's very interesting. That's the aim. But of course, it's not at all clear how you should do this. For example, it's not at all clear if you give me a collection of degrees, how many graphs are there in the size of those degrees? And how to pick one uniformly around them? Well, that's very similar to what we did for the other 20 round about. If we fix the number of edges, I've actually given you an algorithm that will produce such a amount of graphs with precisely those number of edges. And if you draw these edges uniformly around them without a question, that answer will actually be such a uniform round graph. Here, that's not a little obvious. Because we don't even know how many there are. So how are we going to draw one uniform in one? We don't even know how many there are. Okay. And the configuration model is a way to go around that. It somehow it increases the set of, of graphs that you choose for, from. For example, it allows for cell tools and multiple edges. But then there is a relation to this original problem of uh, a uniform picking of a uh, random graph. So we'll get back to that. But let me first describe what the setting is. So I, again, I have a fixed number of vertices. I fix the degrees of all the vertices. And now what I would like to do is um, construct the edges that are compatible with these degrees. So let's do that. This is actually the explanation it works, but my experience is that it always works much better with the picture. So here I have a very simple network. It consists of uh, six elements. And I just draw these degrees um, by spokes. So this means that my vertex 1 has actually degree 3. Vertex 2 has degree 2, vertex 3 has degree 1, vertex 4 has degree 4, etc. So this is not a network. This is not a graph. Because in a graph, I would have to pair these uh, stubs or half edges up. So if I pair all the half edges up, then actually I will get it up. And then if I pair, for example, this one to that one, I will actually draw an edge between vertex 1 and vertex 4. That's how you can do it. But, you know, because I, I know that actually I have to match all of these half edges up, I can just do this uniformly one. So I start here with vertex 1, I take its leftmost half edge, and I pair it to any of the other ones uniformly one. Now, in my experiment, I happen to have drawn that one. And now I think of those two half edges together being paired up into one single edge. And now I can continue. There's still lots of half edges that haven't been paired. So I pick the next one, it will be this one, and I pair it up. Now it happens to be paired up with vertex 3. This is done in a completely uniformly aligned way. So this is the realization that you get. So it's a random graph. These edges are random variables. To which half edge you're, you're, you as a half edge are being paired is completely random. So there's a random process in the background. But it's not uniformly at random. Well, it is uniformly at random, but it's not uniformly at random as in the area in the other graph. Yes? The initial number of half edges of yeah. each vertex is also random. It can be. In, in this description, it is so. But it doesn't have to be. That's actually an important <laughs> observation. Because one of the things that you can do is you take the degree sequence in the real world network that you're interested in. Precisely the same. And now this process will produce a random graph that is precisely those conditions. And then you can still ask the question, does this real world network look like the random graph that I'm producing? If it doesn't, then actually there has to be different ways how the edges are being organized, and it's not this uniform paragraph. So there's some more structure to it. It's not entirely clear what that structure would be. 
But one thing that would arise is that the clustering coefficient is larger, and that means that somehow the edges are organized in such a way that you have more fine clusters. So this tells you, this gives you again a way of preparing a real world network to a random graph having similar properties. And in this case, the similar properties is precisely the increase of three. But you could also take the degrees to be I in the round pairs. That certainly gives you an interesting model. Yeah. 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 Yes, okay, excellent question. Because we've had discussions about this before. Yes, when I say uniform in a I really mean there is a collection of things that I can do. I do every single one with equal probability. I do one, but each one has equal probability. So in this case, this means that this half edge is connected to that half edge, but that has probability which is one over, well, the number of half edges that it can choose from. Okay, if I look back, what is that number? This one I'm pairing, so that one I should count, but I cannot pair it itself, and I wouldn't get an edge. So if all of the other ones, so that means I have a choice out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30. So it, it took this one, and that has probably 1, 30. But the same is true for every other of the 30 half That now here. And now I iterate. So in the next stage, it's not going to be 1 over 30 because two half edges are gone, right? So if I want to pair this one, there's 11 left. So then I choose all of the ones that are left with equal probability, which is 1 over 11. Huh? Sorry. Yes. Oh, seven. Yes, they are. Yes. That's actually a problem because most of the real world networks do not have it. But I'll return to that uh, question. So I have to wait a little bit longer. So I pair this one and then I continue. I just do it all uniformly at random, and this is my final answer. This doesn't much look like a graph, but if I draw it in a more usual way with straight lines, then this is the graph that we've produced. But indeed, if this would have had a half edge more, and this would have had a half edge more, and you would have paired these two together, we would have two arcs between V1 and V4. So that's called the multiple edge. If V1 would have two half edges more, and we would have paired them together, we would have kept got itself. But this is possible. So this is typically not what we have, <coughs> even though in the brain I've now understood that we actually have lots of multiple edges, all in the wrong level. That's all the number of contacts. So there actually it is. Uh, you do have multiple edges. You don't have self You must are not getting to one self yes. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. So, it's a wonderful uh, <laughs> Well, it's not, because here you will typically have few edges to be <coughs> whereas in the brain, apparently, you typically have many edges to be expressed. Yes? There's some good words in, in psychiatric discourse, some schizophrenia uh, uh, types, like in phrenic, it's really a person will just do a collage and choose to repeat the same word over and over. Okay, yeah, well, that, that I can imagine. It really depends on the, on the application area whether whether multiple edges or self groups are reasonable or not. Yeah, you can do the same thing. But don't you probably have to reconcile the income in yes. Excellent point. Yeah, so if you would want to do this in a directed manner, you should really think of these as being arrows. So you have an outgoing arrow that would correspond to a directed edge pointing away, and you have an incoming arrow. And you should match the outgoing arrow to the incoming arrows, but you can only do that in the number actually is set. Okay. Now, if I then go to a real-world network that is directed, and I use the degree sequences that I get there, now every vertex has two numbers, an in degree and an out degree, and by definition, my real-world network will satisfy this description. I've cheated here a little bit as well, because it's not very difficult to, to show that if I take a sum of all the degrees in my network, I actually get an even number. It's called a handshake number. If I sum out the degrees over all the vertices, every edge is counted twice. But it's called the handshake lemma, because if you have a population where people shake hands with one another, and you count the number of handshakes that the different people have made, you will always get an even number, because every handshake is counted twice. Precisely the same as here. Okay? So I started here with the degree sequence for which it is true. The total number of half edges is 14, which is even. If it would be 30, I would be in trouble because then I would like to match my last half edge, but there's nothing to match it. Then what do you do? Alright. 
So is the description clear? This is called the configuration model. Okay, so let's get back to real world networks. <coughs> and this is related to um, this, uh, this problem of having cell groups in multiple edges. Actually, it turns out that if you condition on this not being true, so the condition on the statement that there are no cell groups and there are no multiple edges, then I will get a simple graph. A simple graph is a graph that doesn't have cell groups in multiple edges, so the condition on that it will by definition be true. But not only that, you can actually show that this simple graph is a uniform graph out of the whole collection of graphs that have precisely that degree distribution. That's a very nice property, because it gives you an algorithm to construct one. Now remember that before I was telling you, I don't even know how many there are. Well, this gives you an algorithm to construct one. Of course, it may be difficult, because if the probability of simplicity is very small, you might have to redo it lots of times before you can find a good one. But that turns out not to be true. So the probability of simplicity in this model, in the setting where the degrees don't vary too wildly, um, the probability of simplicity remains uniformly positive. That means that, in a mathematical sense, if I would um, construct a sequence of graphs for which the proportion of vertices is degree 1, and the proportion of vertices is degree 2, and the proportion of vertices is degree 3, etc., all of those proportions would converge. And if that limited degree distribution is sufficiently nice, that is fine at the second moment, then actually the probability of the configuration model for each simple graph will converge in the limited sentence infinity, despite the fact that I have more and more opportunities to create cell groups and multiple edges. The probability of creating something simple will converge to a limiting value, which is simply positive. So that means that in this setting, so for example, the brain, 10 to the power 11, which is huge, but the average degree is 10,000, which is large, but it's not infinite. That means that in that graph, I could give an approximation for the probability of creating something that is simple and, uh, and so no cell groups normal. And that probability would be strictly positive, and actually that value would not depend very much on the size of the network. So if I do it for 10 to the power 10 in vertices, or 10 to the power 11, or 10 to the power 12, I would get an answer that's roughly the same. So that actually means that you can really do this. I mean, in practice, you can just compute it. And since the probability of, of seeing something good is strictly positive, you can just do it a number of times and pick the first one that is good. And the number of times you have to do that would be a geometric time of which is going to be fine. So this is very pragmatic. It really is inspired also by, uh, by the applications. OK. Um, now this is one way how it can be done. There is a different way how you can do it, particularly if you start from a real world network. And this is called by rewiring. And let me try to describe that. So what I want to do is I want to rewire edges in such a way that the degrees for the vertices remain the same. So suppose I do that in the following way. I have four vertices, V1, V2, V3, and V4. And this is how they were connected. I have these two edges. And now instead of this, I apply a randomization step. I just choose these, these let's say, two edges uniformly at random, and I rewire them. It basically means that I replace the blue edges by the two red edges. that look like this. Bear in mind, the number of edges in each of the four vertices does not change. The blue edge is being replaced by a red, red edge. That means that it's, it still is one here, and it's also one there. So by this rewiring strategy, you actually do not change the degree distribution. Yeah. So this you could think of as being what we call a Markov chain on the state of, of graphs. And if you let this Markov chain run indefinitely, the final answer will again be a uniform, simple random graph. Well, simple only if you only re rewire when you're not creating self groups in multiple places. So if you're trying to, if you're attempting to create a self group, you should just not do it. If you allow for self groups in multiple edges, then actually the stationary distribution will be the original configuration model. But if you rule out creating uh, self groups and multiple edges, 
This, the limiting distribution will be the uniform distribution on all graphs that have uh, a precise degree distribution that we start with. So this is a Markovian rewiring dynamical way of producing the same thing. There's one difficulty here, and that is that the description of the uh, configuration model that I've described here will give you the right answer certainly. It precisely gives you the uniform distribution. <laughs> now here, you're applying a Markov chain, and then you actually know that sort of the limiting distribution will be the uniform distribution. And we know by sort of general Markov chain properties that if you were to do this rewiring infinitely often, you actually get the right distribution. So this is a convergence thing. But probably if you do it very often, you're already close. The problem is that we don't know how often you should do it for a very long time. So that means that, I mean, if you really want to do this in practice, you have your real world network, you start rewiring, you do it a lot of times. Have you done it now? Well, I will not be able to tell you whether you have. Or not. So that's a bit of a problem. All right. Now, again, here it, it, it's very easy to, uh, to, to change to a directive model. And I think many of the properties uh, remain true there. All right. Now, maybe one very small digression here. So actually, I started pairing from this side, right? This is vertex one. I started from the left, and I started pairing in this way around. Now, that seems to be the other way. First of all, in many settings, there's no vertex one. There's no notion of one vertex being before another. Label set to be completely arbitrary. So why did I start with vertex one? Why shouldn't I have started with vertex four? Or vertex two? And why should I somehow sort of go from left to right for the 42 block box? Does it make any difference? But it turns out that it doesn't. And this is just a, a property which in probability theory we call exchangeability. It doesn't matter in which order you connect these aspects. The final result will always have the same law. It will not be the same thing, but it will have the same law. So actually, I could start with this one, and then do that one, and then do that one, and then do that one. Or I could even be more restrictive and say, I first connect up this one, and now I'm actually going to take this one. So one of the half inches is incident to the perfect that I connected to. That actually is a van even that is allowed. You're pretty flexible in, in which order you carry these numbers. That's a very nice problem. All right. Now, one of the things that I've described in my first lecture was that many of these uh, uh, real world networks are small worlds. So distances between vertices are typically quite small. Now, Arnold has also described this in the brain, basically saying that the number of, number of hops you need to go between one neuron and another neuron is expected to be of the order of three or four, which is very small compared to the end of the power level. So it really is a tiny world. It's not even a small world, it's a tiny world. Now, how can you understand that from uh, the modeling, for example, on the basis of the configuration model? Well, one thing that you could do is you could take your model and investigate what happens if I look at the path distance between two uniformly chosen vertices and see how that grows when the size of the network tends to be different. If you have that, then it really has to grow because the number of vertices that you can reach in a finite number of steps will just be bounded yeah. by basically the maximum degree to the power of the number of steps that you're looking at. So it has to grow as a function of n. But the question is how fast does it grow? Now, actually, it turns out that there are two settings, two different settings, depending on somehow how heavy tail your degree distribution is. If it's highly variable, you have vertices with humongous degrees, then actually these distances grow very slowly, like the log of the log of the number of vertices. Now, if you've done some simulations, if you take the log of a number, you take a large number, you take the log of that, it becomes a much smaller number, you take the log again, it becomes a finite number, basically. Yeah. So this, this is basically saying that this is are extremely small. Now here, you only take a logarithm once, so it's larger, but still the log of the size is much smaller than the size itself, or power of the size. So this really is a small world uh, phenomenon that we see here. Now here I've drawn that as a picture. So this is, here we draw x, 
basically from, uh, from 1 up to 10 to about 10. And here you can see the log. Now it grows, you see that, but it grows fairly slowly. But you can sort of see that it will grow a bigger and bigger. Now this is the log of the log. Now from your position you will not be able to distinguish this from the, from the line, which is a constant. Now if I go and stand next to the screen, and I look at it, look at it, I will actually see that it does slightly increase. But it's almost impossible to see. So a log log is basically the same as constant, for practical purposes. Of course, from a mathematical point of view, it doesn't affect you. Mathematically true, the blah 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 um, have heavy yield degrees are scale free, and that's described by an exponent that basically governs how large the large degrees are. And that exponent I typically write as tall. And basically, uh, tall larger than three means that we have to find a second bond for the degrees. So that would mean in a, in a real world network context that if I take the sum of the squares of the degree and divide it through by n, that would actually be a band of n. That's my tall is larger than three. But the total is between 2 and 3, that number will actually grow by positive power of energy. So that's the really the decision. And what we see is that if this tau is in between 2 and 3, you have this W logarithmic behavior, and actually that tau appears here explicitly. So the smaller tau becomes really the smaller the decision. Okay. So that was the first model that I wanted to describe, and this is a static model. I describe, I tell you beforehand what it is, and I even tell you what the degrees are. Now suppose we would want to build a dynamical model, and a dynamical model would mean that as time progresses, my network size increases. I add more and more vertices to my network. Then I'm in a dynamical set. And, uh, one particular model that has attracted a lot of attention is called the preferential attachment model, and this is a model that it was uh, uh, proposed for the first time in a networking context by Albert and Banabasi, but actually you, who's a mathematician, already proposed it in 1925, and Simon did it again in 1955. And they actually proved the results that Albert and Banabasi just simulated. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So apparently it's a very natural model, um, but it, it, the novelty of Albert and Barabas is really to relate it to the real network data. That's something that uh, you and Simon certainly did not. Okay, so what is what, what is preferential attachment model and what does it mean to have preferential attachment? So preferential means that there is a preference to do something. And what the preference uh, refers to is that um, vertices are more likely to connect to older vertices in the network. Remember that it's dynamic, so vertices are coming in one by one. So a vertex comes in, and it needs to decide whom it wants to connect to in the network. Who are its friends? And he's allowed to choose, let's say, n friends. n is a parameter. He's allowed to choose five friends. How does he want to do that? Well, in preference to the you say that, it's more, that he's more likely to make a connection to uh, an individual who is there who already has a high degree. That's the preference. So you basically think of uh, certain individuals as having uh, very good social skills, and these individuals are more likely to, to meet the newcomer in town, and therefore they're more likely to befriend this person. That's the idea. That's what is uh, uh, the preference of having all. So new vertices are more likely to be connected to vertices that already have a high degree. This is sometimes also called the rich and richer model, because people who have a high degree are more likely to get an even more high degree. But that actually introduces lots of variability in degrees. And this is what you get. So this is, first of all, this is the model. So f i n a vertex comes in, and it decides to connect its n edges to, or any, any one of its n edges to the i vertex to the probability that is proportional to the degree of vertex i at that time, means a plus a parameter. 
The parameter is just constant. So this is sometimes called the F line preferential effect. But other versions have been studied as well. This one is particularly important because um, what comes out is that if you do your attachment in the following way, and in fact the albert barabasi model did not have this delta. So the, the addition of the delta makes it more general. And what you see is that if you look at this model, then you can show mathematically that it will have the power of the resequence. That means that the proportion of radius to the degree k will converge to a deterministic limit. And that deterministic limit is power with a certain exponent that is described by this formula. It's 3 plus delta over m. And this delta parameter has to be larger than minus n, otherwise this could actually be negative. And then can be power So this thing has to be positive, and because all the degrees are always at least n, any sort of subtraction that is smaller than n is a power. And what you see is that if you're subtracting of more, then actually the preferential attachment becomes more pronounced, and your tails become heavier. That corresponds to a pole that is smaller. And any value larger than 2 is possible. That's what comes out. And this is a plot of the degree distribution. And actually, this degree distribution looks a lot like what you would get if you were to draw IID band variables from the same linear degree distribution. So you see some very nice uh, sort of uh, concentrated part here that is almost deterministic, and then random fluctuations in the tail. That's typically what you get if you take an IID sample of random variables from a parallel. You get pictures that look a lot like. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, this preferential attachment mechanism is very simple, yet it produces a, a random bars that have this peculiar scale deviation. So it gives a possible explanation for the occurrence of the scale deviation. It's very good to Whereas in the configuration model, you just stick it in. So you don't explain it, but you put it in your model. It's just an assumption. This actually gives a possible explanation for why we see this uh, uh, part of the data. That's why it's important. All right. Now, actually, it turns out, and this refers back to my, uh, my, my previous slide of universality, turns out that the behavior in, in this graph, at least on the basis of uh, uh, graph distances, is very similar to, to the configuration model. Again, when you have finite variance degrees that corresponds to tau being in between 3 and infinity, distances are logarithmic. If uh, your uh, parallel degree distribution, the, the parallel exponent is in between 2 and 3, distances are logarithmic. You basically see the same equality. It doesn't really matter whether you use the configuration model with the degree distribution that comes out of the preferential attachment model, or whether you use the preferential attachment model itself. There's only one slight difference. That is the fact that you have a 4 here. 4 divided by the average value of 4, 4 minus 2. Whereas for the configuration model, you have it. So this is a lot of That's the only difference. All right. How am I doing time? Ten minutes. OK, good. Now, of course, I mean, I've described two models, or actually three models, including the Arizona and track, but there are lots more models that take other aspects into account. Now, first of all, what is bad about the models that I've discussed so far? Well, what we see in many real-world networks is that they have a high amount of clustering, many triangles, and they don't have that here. So, for example, the configuration model is what we call locally tree-like. If I look at the neighborhood around the vertex, I will basically see a tree. And the tail I will not see five. So that's a bad property, certainly when I uh, want to move to uh, uh, social networks. Um, they don't have communities, because they're not being empowered. And one of the things that we see in the brain is that it has a modular structure. You can think of that in terms of communities. The same is true for social networks. Um, and also, they're very basic models. They don't have any sort of properties uh, related to the races. Now, if you think about social networks, or maybe even uh, about the brain, we now know that there are lots of different neurons, and different neurons connect to one another in a different way. That's not taken into account in any of these models. There are no different types of races. And for, for example, for a social network, we could think about gender. Um, maybe you know, the, the friendships between men and the friendships between women, and the friendships between men and women, are more or less prevalent uh, depending uh, on which categories you see. That's not taken into account here at all. 
another thing that is not taken into account is geometry. And one of the things we've seen in Alman's law is that the neurons that are close by are much more likely to have a geisha than neurons that are very far away. Even though neurons that are very far away can have a geisha. There are long range geishas, but they're much less perfect. Now, if you want to model, put that into a model, you have to start with a model that has geometry. And these models don't. So let's go over a few other models that have been proposed, but in the general context of complex networks. So the fact that you don't have clustering in the configuration model, you can easily resolve by adding it. Now, one way you could do that is, um, aside from the fact that you say that every vertex has a certain degree, it also has a certain amount of uh, triangles. So that means you count the number of triangles that the vertex is in, and then you pair up triangles by basically uh, uniforming it around them, making triplets, and then drawing the triangle. It's a very easy extension of the configuration model that will allow you to put clustering in. But then you will have triangles. You will not have cycles of size 4 or complete graphs of size 4, which you will also have in a social network. Right? You can extend it again, but then it becomes a very complicated model. All right. Now, another model that has been uh, proposed is a model that does have geometry, and it's called the small world model. And uh, uh, let me draw the picture here. This is actually the model that was proposed by, uh, by Watson Strogos. And it's a very simple idea. So you start with a very regular structure, like a ring, where everybody is connected to its two neighbors. And now you start rewiring some of the edges into the long range connections. So you break uh, uh, edges up, and you rewire them. If you do that for a few, you have a mix between this ring structure and something like which looks a bit like the average ring around the graph, you have both, where you have some problem with it which you be connected to all vertices basically equally. And if you increase the number of rewirings, you basically in the end go to a completely random structure, and that random structure will be the average ring around the graph. So it allows you to interpolate between something that is geometric and something that is completely non-geometric. Now, one thing that is very special about this setting here is that distances are actually quite large. If I take two vertices uniformly at random, actually the graph distance between them will be microscopic. So it will be of the order n. That's not what we're seeing in the real networks. As soon as you start rewiring, already we have very little uh, rewires, but just a very small proportion of cases have been rewired, all of a sudden the distances go from linear to logarithmic. So it's a way to explain small worlds. That's why it's called the small world model. But it's very confusing, because I use the small world property much more generally. For me, a graph is a small world, but its distances are quite small, logarithmic or small. The small world model has that, but it's certainly not the only model that has that. Now, it has given rise to lots of confusion, because this model also has lots of clustering. The clustering actually comes from this part. So if you're intermediate, you have a combination of a lot of clustering and short connections, short, uh, short average, average family. And that's something that's called the small worldness, which I think is a bad name, because small worldness refers to the small world model, not to it being a small world. It is also a small world, but it also refers to the amount of triangles that have in there, which is not called in the name small worldness. So it's not entirely appropriate. Uh, but this model actually has been uh, well, proposed for uh, a model for the brain. I think it's a poor model, and let me try to explain why. Well, one of the problems is that um, in the small world model, you basically have connections of two types, basically near and neighbor connections and long range connections. But my guess would be that in a real geometric model for the brain, um, how you have connections to all scales, and it's just that they become less prevalent as this is gross. We would have to really model and say that the connection probability between two elements that are somehow far, that that will decay with distance. As actually you see in the pictures by Alan uh, Jessica. And that's not here. When you're far away, your probability is something. When you're close, your probability is something else. It only has two values. There's no continuity in terms of the spatial distance. That, I don't think, is very realistic for the brain. Okay. I think it's because I mean, this model is just for a lot of microscopic networks. 
And the edge is there with the probability that depends on the Euclidean distance that is eating to a certain power, and then another power of some other attribute. And this attribute would be um, uh, how much are like are the degrees? How many joint names do these vertices at this moment have? It's a dynamic process. So you look at the graph, you investigate what the scale object is, and then you decide on the basis of that what the edge probability is. And then you flip a coin with that edge probability, you decide on the edge and then you do this as often as you like. So, of course, it depends very strongly on what this k object is, and they have proposed different ones, for example, the product of the degrees, and that's something that looks a lot like a preferential attachment model, and you can also take the, the absolute value of the difference of the degrees, and then you're actually more likely to connect to vertices that have quite different degree from yours, so this will give this sort of thing. All right. Now then they actually match these to real world networks of the brain, and as it turns out, the best match you get is, or the best fit you get, is when you take the matching rule, and this says that you take this k object, which appears here, as a function of the number of common neighbors that you and me have, divided by the total number of uh, neighbors that you and me have. That apparently gives the best match. They have lots of different uh, rules, and this gives the best match. And what's the intuition? What? What's the intuition behind this k? I think, I mean, it's basically a way to make the model more flexible. Yeah. And it gives you a way of saying, well, you know, just simulate the models and see which is the best fit to a real world network. And it might actually tell you something about this real world network, in this case, that brain analysis. So basically, what this rule will tell us is that. Vertices that share many neighbors are also more likely to be connected to one another. Related to cluster. Pushes to the smaller. Friends or friends or friends. It pushes you to the cluster. Okay. So what they actually did was uh, estimate then the, these parameters, and they, they turn out to be these values. So. Uh, Distance uh, becomes a, a very relevant into this negative power, which means that you're more likely to connect to things that are close by than the things that are far away, and that's governed by this value, which is roughly minus one. And then what they've did, done is that they actually looked at some statistics of these network, for example, the degree distribution, the clustering, uh, per vertex, the between the centrality, the edge length distribution, etc. And they've actually compared the, the statistics that you get out of the random network to the thing you get from the real network that you have. And these are not very far away. So the Kolmogorov stream of statistics is about 0 to 10. That basically says that these distributions are not very far away. Uh, what kind of brain networks are they using them on? It's either fMRI or EGD data, but I don't know. Yes. Yes, that might be the Yes, the 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 yeah, now the properties are just what? No properties. About the behavior. What has to do with behavior? What about the behavior? No. No. These models have not been investigated from a mathematical perspective. So we don't know whether they're small worlds. Well, they've done simulation studies that show that they are small worlds, but there's no mathematical theory like the one that was presented in the simulation question. Yeah. So this is another model which comes from a paper by Kaiser and Hilkepaar, um, and it's called Modeling the Development of Cortical Systems Networks, and it's again it's a dynamical model, but now the connections are being made uh, with a proportionality constant and then an exponential function. Um, and here they did not compare using the words neural statistics, but they actually just computed things of the network, for example the clustering coefficient and the average for the path length. And these things would match. So it's a reasonable model for these things. Whether it's a reasonable model for the brain, it's not so clear, of course. 
All right, let's skip this. And uh, let's close with this. Um, so that's actually your question, uh, Ricardo. In many of these models, we actually do not know what, uh, for example, the average mass things, how they scale with, as a function of the network size. Um, there are some work, and uh, uh, the, the results that we've seen so far seem to indicate that there's a high amount of human sound, but it's still working for me. Yes, you shouldn't have missed the first part of the lecture. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> So what I mean with universality is that uh, a network with similar properties, for example, similar similar degree distributions, also have similar properties in terms of other things. For example, gravity. Yes, that's the usual notion for physicists. Yeah. Of the universality. Yeah. Yeah, there are several studies on simple models on top of that model. How do you do this? Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so thank you. So, so in, in, in physics, people are interested in the universality of the phenomena happening on top of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. And then, I will only go that to that world. So, okay, okay, so I'm not going to ask you your phone. Well, no, you wouldn't be pointing it, but of course, I mean, this is a very, very important aspect. So suppose, suppose you perform percolation on the network. You remove edges with uh, an IID probability. Do you see properties close to the phase transition that are like in these different models? That's another notion of human side. For instance, yes, for yeah. instance. Or an easy model, yeah. or... Yeah, you put the model on the field and you see a phase transition. And then as a phase transition, you see great yeah. response. <laughs> so what, I mean, the, the more or less common knowledge in physics that we, we know that if you take a nervous one of breath or you take um, a lot of struggles out of the model, the population model, you essentially get a new field behavior and a new experience. But, but things get complicated, you have scale free networks and you have that. In fact, there are lots of mathematical results about this. Yes, and then you can just now for for um for for the um transmitted space. Well yeah, different space. So we have an extended and enlarged of the critical uh, phase when you have um, uh, disorder, uh, finite topological ah, distance, and and parallel. I'm sorry. So ah, you have okay. yeah. then it yeah. matters. Yeah, that's right. right. But let me give another example. I mean, percolation is one of the things that has been studied a lot. And it, it's very useful. Suppose I have the internet and some of my things aren't working. Is my network still connected? Or is it not? Well, that's precisely the percolation phase transition. Now, I was describing that the, 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 the preferential attachment model is in the same universality class as the uh, configuration model in terms of distances. The percolation phase transition is completely different. So we understand both. Well, for some models, uh, so the, the, the percolation phase transition on the configuration model tends to be linear, close to the critical exponent 1, whereas the preferential adaptive model is believed to have infinitely many uh, uh, derivatives that are zero. So it's infinitely smooth at the phase transition. So that's possible with 5,000 phase transition. So this is an aspect that is completely non universal This is our. These, uh, uh, these processes on the mind not. Uh, really, I mean, uh, sort of a refinement of the notion of the human side. Good point. Yes, yes, let's we'll stop here for the quick review. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me well enough here? Are you, can you hear me well enough? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, today and tomorrow I will talk about vertical long range connectivity. What I had, what I said in the first two talks were related mainly to numbers within one cubic millimeter of cortex. Um, but as you see, the 
typical pyramidal cell here with its dendritic tree and its local axonal tree has a, a main axon which leaves the gray matter and runs <coughs> over the white matter at some distant place. Uh, here again, a feeling for the density of neurons. Um, and uh, so, so this is the situation. Uh, pyramid cells have these local collaterals and then they go out and somewhere in, go through the white matter and enter, in most, in most cases, enter the cortex again somewhere else. Some of them also leave the cortex completely. Um, but the majority goes in and provides long-range connections. Now, how, uh, I will briefly talk about the methods, how you follow these, uh, tra sect uh, these fibers. I will briefly say something about a nice little theory, and then say something about the global connectivity in the mouse cortex, and then move on to patchy connections in large brains. And tomorrow I will move on to the human cortical white matter. Tracer methods are methods where you inject some substance into the brain. The animal is under anesthesia. You make a small hole and uh, inject some substance. And most and uh, the, the neurons are very ready to take in whatever you inject, more or less. <laughs> and uh, they transport it along the axon. Um, I, um, there is all the time there is some, some transport in the axon, up and down the axon of substances, and uh, so these artificial substances are also transported along with them. There is a slow transport which goes up to millimeters per day, and a fast transport which goes up to centimeters per day. So after some time, you have to euthanize the animal, and then you need to you make you have to be make sure that you use substances which you can then visualize in the microscope. There are two types of tracers, namely the so-called anterograde tracers. Then you inject some substance; it is taken up by the cell bodies and transport it along, along the axon to the terminal fields. So these substances answer the question where to, where does a certain region project to? Uh, such uh, examples are uh, radioactive amino acids or these Facervus vulgaris or region agglutinin or biotinylated dextran amine. Uh, here is an example of what this looks like. So this is a frontal, uh, frontal section through a mouse brain. Here is the cortex. And here we are close to the injection site and we see how fibers emanate from the injection site locally, but also uh, over a distance here or here or here. Um, the other kind of tracers are these retrograde tracers. When you inject this substance, it's taken up by the axon terminals and is transported in the opposite direction. So you see in the end the, the cell bodies which project, which project to this place. So this, these substances answer the question where get this region, gets this region input from. Uh, the substances are often fluorescent dyes, or horseradish peroxidase is one of them. Then there are also substances which go very go well, equally more or less equally well in both directions. Biocytin, for example, neurotropic viruses can be used. And here are some examples. Here, uh, the nice thing about fluorescent dyes is that you can inject several different dyes in different places in, in one brain and can so answer several questions within one experiment. In this case, uh, was injected a, a light blue fluorescent dye into area 17 in the red and a greenish blue into area 41 in the red, and you see here 
this is a region which projects to area 17, and this is a region which projects to uh, area V1. Here is another example. Uh, here we use TOS ready for oxidase. It was injected into the spinal cord of a rat. Here you see the motor cortex, and you see the neurons which project directly to the spinal cord. Uh, in some cases, for example, with biotin related gastron anine, you can sometimes get see the whole neurons. So this was injected, I don't remember where, but uh, you see the retrograde state neurons, not only cell bodies, but the whole dendritic and axonal tree. You can even use that in human brains, although very not so well, but <laughs> here uh, we took there's a piece of a human brain and we injected four different dyes here and you need to leave it needs to run for a long time because the tissue, there's no axonal transport anymore so the, the dye uh, goes along the lipid lip, it has, uh, is lipophilic and goes along the membranes but still after some time you can see so here is an injection site and you see uh, that fibers were see where fibers were running or from here to here but usually you do it in alive animals uh, because yeah, in humans you, it would be very tedious <laughs> but you can see here for example uh, you can see that bundles tend to stick together from the same injection site um, ok can we ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, That's a question I've been trying to make last year. Uh, every time someone explains me how to do this operation, it looks to me like a percolation problem. And yet, uh, I never heard uh, nobody that there is a statistical issue. So it is more or less like uh, when the author said yes. No, this is not. This is just that pure data. Well, I don't believe this is pure data because probably if you do, if you want to be able to do the same injection several times, several times with the same kind of not possible because of the do, mm -hmm. you will see that the 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 parts of the thing are not the same. If it's not the case, please explain me why it's not. Because this seems to be like a percolation problem. Yes, it is a percolation problem. By definition, this is a percolation. Either you tell me that everything is obvious from the tube, but it was P as well, or something I'm missing. But, uh, I mean, there are defined connections between cortical areas. <laughs> so, whenever you inject in area V1, you will find projections to V2 and V4 uh, so, so there are it's not that you get each time a completely different picture but that's a question yesterday with our who said it's not run because we have a uh, I thought the name should be specific selectivity selectivity so I, I agree with you with selectivity but I want to know what graph I'm, I'm working with no, but it might be that P is really one here but you have very so nice to understand Channels. I would like to understand why. But yesterday we talked about connectivity of individual neurons, and here, I mean, this, this, this injection stain many, many, many neurons in one region, so it does not tell you, it does not tell you anything from neuron to neuron, but from region to region. In that case. That's a single neuron that you create at its end to its start. And for a good view of what the transition are single neurons. So, what I mean, should you ask single neurons that you stay from, from their end to their origin? Is that that you have something which activates something which activates something which activates something? My main part of the dendritic tree is not reachable for some reason. Main part of the of the axonal tree is not reachable. My question is, how much uh, statistics do you need 
isso. Não? É, I think it's something that in, in neuroscience people believe that data is data and the analysis can be after. Uh, and you know that it, it's never like this. I, I don't see any field in which that is just done. But maybe it's a case here. I would like to understand if this is a case. That's what you said. That's what you said. That is reproducible. For sure. But reproducible means what? That you get exactly the same tree if you reproduce several times. I, I think it will become more clear later. I hope. I hope. <laughs> so how do we get back to? that. Okay. Uh, I just wanted briefly to mention that it is also possible to trace substances in vivo in man magnetic resonance imaging. Um, there are manganese, you can be injected like this and you can follow it, you can look at it at the same animal over several days. And um, so you, and you don't need to kill the animal, so it's, it's uh, something you can look at in vivo. Um, a, a disadvantage is that it is not good for the neurons. The, the neurons will, um, they will die after some time. So we tried another substance, biocytin, which is more uh, something which is uh, more natural for the brain. Um, and here you see, this is for example, uh, this is yeah, our chemists managed, managed to make biocytin also visible in the magnetic resonance imaging. So these are pictures from an alive rat. Here is the injection site, and these are um, places where you see in MRI uh, projections. And we looked in the light microscope after the after the animal was euthanized, uh, and it, it's really so. This corresponds to this and. Uh, this corresponds to, to this, so it is uh, something you can see both in the living brain and in histology. Okay, it, now um, another point uh, related to all this. <laughs> Brains can have very different sizes, and uh, I think we will have Ramir hear more about it later today. So, uh, if you compare the surface area of cortex of one hemisphere in a, in a mouse, in a monkey, and a human being here drawn to scale, and you know that there are cortical-cortical connections in all cases, it is clear that, I mean, it is clear that you have a different problem here than you have here. <laughs> How uh, can you keep up a good connectivity in a large cortex or not, or what is the situation? Um, and what can you, can you anything conclude from studies in a mouse with respect to that, with uh, long range connections in a human being? Now, um, or in a large brain. So, uh, the answer is yes, you can, but you cannot, but of course there are differences uh, in small and large brains. But let's, uh, ah, before we do that, let me very briefly uh, bring up an abstract scheme which once uh, was developed by Valentin Breitenberg. Um, it, when we thought about long-range connectivity and thought, well, obviously the cortex is an associative memory device, it would be good if really each region is, is connected to each other so that you do not need many steps to get everywhere. And he was, um, so his idea was maybe a, a good scheme. Can you, can you understand me? Thank you. 
So wondering how, if you would make a good associative device, how would you make it? Uh, he suggested you should parcel, make a parcellation into square root compartments, meaning by this, if n is the total number of neurons, you would need a root n compartments, and in each compartment root n neurons, and this would give you something like this. So you would have in each compartment as many neurons as compartment, and then you need, can send one fiber to each of these compartments. Um, would be a nice approach. <laughs> um, he, he wondered if how close the reality is from that. He, he made an estimate how large the compartments would need to be in a mouse and in a human being. Uh, to fulfill this kind of connectivity. And uh, he came up with the following numbers. In the mouse cortex, where you have about eight or nine times 10 to the six neurons in one hemisphere, cortical hemisphere, you would need to have about 3,000 compartments. The diameter would then be about 0.17 millimeters. In the human cortex, you would need to have 100,000 compartments and the diameter of those would need to be about one millimeter in size or would be about one millimeter in size when you put this number of neurons in it. Um, and this fits quite nicely to, to, to the reality. Uh, no, it, it, it's interesting that the largest dendritic trees in, in mouse are about, have about that size and the largest dendritic trees in human cortex have about that size. He also wondered about the volume of white matter you would need. The echo comes not from me. <laughs> I see. Uh, the volume, he also made estimates of the volume of white matter you need to, to, do, to have such a um, connectivity and in any case you need much, much, uh, this is the white matter in a mouse cortex, this is the cortex, this is the white, cortical white matter and in human you would of course need much, much more as it is the case. Here, all what is stained black here is the cortical white matter containing these cortical cortical axons. So this fear theory fits quite nicely to reality. Of course, in reality, nothing is as as clear as or clean as in theory, and we know that it, we do not have such a homogeneous connectivity in the cortex. We know that some regions are connected directly, others are not connected di directly. But I think it's a nice little theory, and it uh, also is a small world thing where you have um, local connectivity and uh, distant connectivity. Okay, so let's go now to re reality and look for the global connectivity in the mouse cortex based on a tracer. So this is a mouse cortex and here we injected somewhere in the cortex a uh, tracer biotinidated dextral amine and in each animal we, we injected in a different place to get some general idea. We were not so much interested in what does which area projects to which, but to get a general idea, uh, uh, some, some general idea about long-range connectivity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shall we switch off the internet maybe? I, I just lost some noise. I was trying to yeah, understand yeah, yeah. what was going on. Yeah, it's, it's, 
tem alguém com algum tipo de computador que ele não se Ele não tem uma musiquinha para isso.
Um, and this is an example of a very uh, loose projection that you have fibers, only a few fibers, and only restricted to, to one layer, so you can find both of this. And we try to quantify this a bit um, by using this method, this was a, one of our co-workers, um, by counting the number of intersections of fibers with a straight line in the microscope. You see, uh, of course, the denser of the fiber fibers are, the more intersections you have. And uh, but in order to have not to, to not be biased to so much to to one direction of fibers, and we use such a why is the density increasing? Sorry? Why is the density increasing? Uh, no, no, it's just it's not increasing. It was just showing that with increased density you get more intersections. Um, it's not increasing. <laughs> Uh, now there is an old formula which was used already by before in 1777 with this needle, what was this needle, needle problem, <laughs> uh, which gives a relation between length per area and the number of intersections and the length of your test line. Um, now our problem was, yeah, was. Uh, also including the third dimension, so we had to put some thoughts in the question. I mean, uh, the, the intersections can be a, a different depth of the section, so in a, in a way you, you again do as if you would have, if you deal with the projected lengths of the fibers. So also, you have to take into account that uh, if uh, that of course you get more intersections if, uh, uh, if, if the fiber is more parallel, look, more parallel to the line. Taking all this into account, you end up with you, uh, you end up with the fact that you have to include this pi over four, and you have to include, of course, the section density. So in the end, the formula was number of num length per volume is equal to two times the number of intersections divided by the length of your line and the section thickness. Is this assuming that the things you're measuring are really straight lines? Because in reality, they're wobbly, right? Is it, sorry? Is this assuming that the, 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 the things you're measuring are straight lines? Um, yes, it does. Because in reality, they're wobbly somewhat, right? Uh, a little bit, a little bit, yes. So that's not supposed to make a difference? Mm, not much, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we ended up with these numbers. In the case of the low densities I showed you, we have something like three, a density of 3 meters per cubic millimeter. And in the case of the high density, something like 25 meters per cubic millimeter which sounds a lot, but it is very, very little compared to the total density of axons in the neuropene, as I said yesterday, of something like 4 kilometers per cubic millimeter. You said 1 to 4. Sorry? You said 1 to 4. Yes, 1 to 4. Okay. <laughs> I believe more than 4. <laughs> um, and uh, so even the high density, which looks quite dense in the microscope, is less than 1% of the total density in that, at that point. Now, this, these numbers re refer to these distant projections, where you have these low, slowly, um, these not, you know, these hatched regions. So this would be a low density and this is a high density region, but as you see the flag here, it is still much denser in the direct vicinity, and we try to figure out what the density could be there. It is quite complicated and full of assumptions. Uh, you can, it is too dense here to, to really make such counts as uh, of the intersections. So what we did was to estimate the total length of stained fibers 
the first of all, the number of neurons in this we can estimate, then we divide and um, multiply it with the total length of axon per neuron, which we, I think I didn't mention it yesterday, it was about 10 to 14 millimeter. Then, then estimate the fiber, the total fiber length in these hatched regions. Uh, from this data which I just showed before, and then subtracting subtracting two, two from one, we should have all the rest of fibers in these black regions. And you end up with something like 38 to 141 meters per cubic millimeter, which is more than before, but it is still only a few percent of the total density of fibers. Um, so, con what are our conclusions from that? Um, yeah, these are the numbers I just said. I think I jumped to the, jump more directly to that. Conclusions on horizontal connectivity, that you have a great spatial divergence of projections, of a factor of more than 100 in the mouse and even 1,000 in the monkey. So, uh, you think about surface area, you reach, is it understandable? Yeah. <laughs> this means that you must also have a high degree of convergence at any place. Somebody must fill up the 4 kilometers of cubic millimeters in some other places. Also, um, what you can conclude from it is that the largest part of the terminal field, about two thirds, connects neurons within the same area and in neighboring areas. So, as you have seen in the surface uh, drawings, that the largest part of the surface of the field was always in in the vicinity of the injection site. Okay. Are there questions to this part? Yes. Um. Yeah. 
this decrease in the strength of connections. Uh, but you can have, at a distant point, you can have again higher, you can have higher uh, project um, connections, higher density of connections than in, for example, in this region. So for, for long range connections, there is not a, it's not so that the further you are away, the, the smaller the density, so there are spots where, yeah, it's a decent small network that you have spots with higher density, but I'm not sure if I answered your question. But I will show, we will come to the monkey in a moment, maybe that helps. <laughs> yeah. Do you hope there will be to know where the first two questions well, is there a way to know if these connections they are highly private or not? So that's just question one. And the other is whether it's maybe quickly the tracer as it travels, as it goes through the region, do the tracer respect uh, cyclotectonic or Mayello architectonic borders that Broadman um, are on and on more in us? Here. At least here in the mouse not. I here this black spot. This is not only one area here. We injected in one area, but but this extends over the same and over the over neighboring areas. Um, yeah. So at least in the mouse, where all the areas are anyhow terribly small. Uh, you would not see, you would, yeah, you would not see any borders. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me now come to large brains. And what is typical for large brains is they have very much patchy connections, much more than we see it in the mouse. So this is a very nice paper from Amir Hanna and Hanna, showing injection, trace injections in, the, in, the, in different areas in the monkey. So this is V1, V2, V4, and 7A, so in the parietal cortex. And what is stri striking are these many, many patches. Here I must say all these patches are located within the same area. So it's not directly comparable to, 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 our, to what I showed in the mouse. Um, of course, also in the monkey you have projections to different areas, but they are not shown in this paper. I mean, in the monkey everything is much more difficult because the distances are much larger. So in this paper, they only focus on projections within one area. Still, it is interesting uh, that it is so difficult to have these patchy connections. In, in the mouse, you have it also sometimes. Or for example, here you see you see a patch here or a patch here or three patches here. But it is not that common. The point is that, yeah, as I said before, the areas are so so small in the mouse that uh, some of these patches. May I ask you a question? So uh, you said you can see three patch, but it is not as common. Which so are it, it is not common. So you said, but it is not common to see three patch. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, no. I, so I, I understand this is a problem with this thing. Is that correct? No. Is that no, I think if I would inject an animal exactly here again, I would probably also get these three patches. But but it's I mean compared to the richly patchy pattern in the monkey, this is not much. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I can show you the other pictures again. Uh, uh, here for example, Ron, let's look. Um, no, where is it? Here. Yeah, it's. I mean, all, all the patches you see here are located in distant areas, but but in the region here, in the close region, so within one area, 
or also neighboring areas who do not see such a patchy pattern. And what you just saw in the monkey needs to be compared to, to such a region. Of course, the monkey has also long-range connections in different areas, but in the picture I showed you, you saw only a region corresponding to such a small, to such a weak cloud, to one area, in the same area. Um. Okay, so in this, so now, so the conclusion is that in large brains you have three kinds of projections. You have the local connectivity, so the axon collaterals in, in the region of the neuron, you have the distant, very distant connectivity via the right matter going to a different cortical area, but you have in addition uh, collaterals running in the gray matter over long distances up to a few millimeters and they make patchy connections now and then. So you, I would say you in large brains you have short range, long range and middle range connections. How do you define the, the, the intermediate range, not the, not the small, not the big, but the meaning of the distant, the, the, the one which is between? How do you define it? How do you distinguish it? Uh, you distinguish uh, Well, it, it's not going by the white matter, it is going, it's long collaterals running within the gray matter. And then uh, producing. Uh, so, so these captures come from collaterals in the gray matter, running horizontally in the gray matter, and producing a patch here and a patch in the here. Here, a one collateral can be can make several patches. This one, or this one, or this one. But all, I mean, here many neurons are ejected, so so the patches are patches from uh, the, that population of neurons. Um, and uh, from the study, it's known that all these are in the same cortical area. From histology, I you can't see it here, but. But they know it. <laughs> it's not clear, really. Oh, yes. Just a comment. Uh, I'll start this probably something related to the colonial organization. Yeah. Between yeah. the uh, red and the monkey. And this is a very interesting question. Uh, <coughs> this is related to small and big brains. Mm -hmm. Or this is due because they are completely different in their architecture. Uh, and the robots are different from primates. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, we have been investigating this in our institute now, and many people work on Catherine Street with um, Faith Boyd. And testing this in a big robot. So a robot that has a mm -hmm. brain. That is the ROG. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know for the moment, uh, it seems that they have the same salt and pepper battery mm -hmm. uh, like uh, in the Robin. So mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. not a very long time. Okay. But uh, for sure, the patchy connectivity is related to the colonial organization of the world. Yes. It's very uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and yeah. vigorous in, in the mind. So, um, yeah, so in that work we did not, uh, let's forget about long range connections. Uh, I will talk about that a bit more tomorrow. Let's stay, stick to this, sorry. Uh, Passion connections. What we asked ourselves, what is the variability of these patches? What, what, yeah, what is constant, what changes, what, 
is it possible to make a generalized model on that? And for this, we went to the literature. Um, that's not now visible, but we looked for all the papers we could get from extracellular injections. We looked at the species, at the um, this is, I think, the diameter of the injection site, the diameter of the patches, the number of patches, the distance of patches to the to the injection site, the distance between patches, distance of maximum patches, and so on. And uh, the species involved are mainly uh, cat, monkey, but also some rats. And here's some more of these papers. And these are papers which, that are much fewer papers, but these are papers which, papers which made intracellular injections, so you can, could say something about patches from individual neurons, how this compares to the patches from neuronal groups. And this is the result. Um, so, when you have, so you look, on, from the bottom, on the cortex, you have these cells here, and let's say this cell has been injected. So these data are all from from single cell injections. The, this shows the diameter of this uh, um, of the local axon tree, and this shows the patches. And what we can say that the number of patches. Right. In, in average, when I say average, I mean talking about different papers, different authors, uh, and different species, range between one to five uh, patches, maximum number eight. The radius of this local spread is 300 to 500 micrometer. The diameter of patches is 200 to 400 micrometer. The distance to the cell body is, can be very different, ranges between 0.4 up to 5 millimeters. And if you inject neighboring neurons, they share some of their patches, not all of their patches. Um, when you make from the results from extracellular injections, where you almost inject many neurons at the same time, uh, you can say the number of patches is much larger, something like 10 to 20, or can go up to 58 patches. And this the number depends very much on the injection size, also on the brain size, and also somewhat on the hierarchical area, uh, on the hierarchy of the area. The size of the patches is comparable to, to those of single neurons, uh, which speaks in favor of what you said about columnar structure. The distance of patches to cell body and between each other is similar as in single neurons, but depends strongly on the whole of the hierarchy. Um, okay, so um, what we can say, it is possible to make a generalized model. You can get these numbers and you can give ranges. And this can be easily adapted to particular areas. The size of the patches is relatively constant. The number of patches depends mainly on the size of the injection, somewhat also on a hierarchical level. And the spread of patches depends mainly on area of hierarchy. I show this again here. We saw this already. Here in V1, you, you have all the patches are close together, while the higher you get up in the cortex, the more they are spread over a larger area. Um, yeah, one question which probably you will also wonder about, what, who fills the space between these patches? <laughs> Uh, what would happen if you would make large and large injections? When you make large injections, what happens? Do you get larger patches? Do you get more patches or whatever? Do you fill up the space or what? Um, this shows data from also from Amia's paper. It shows that, uh, so these are, it shows uh, here the patch width, so the size of the patches. Uh, in two cortical areas, V1 and V2, uh, V4, and uh, 
here this this is from small injections and this is from about twice as large so yeah large injections and you see the num the size of the patches does not change very much while the number of patches changes considerably here is the number of patches here you get uh, with twice as large injection you get about twice as num uh, twice the number of patches Now, um, I'm, yeah, of course, the question is what is the role of patches? What? And here, my personal opinion is that, uh, first of all, I said yesterday that the connections between neurons are, are weak. So if you send one spider somewhere alone, it will probably be too weak to have any effect. So it is probably better to send all this several neurons to one or um, make, uh, to make, yeah, to, to allow for a cooperation at a certain place to get the activity through. Um, also, yeah, this is one part. Uh, the other one is that a point which was made by Malach, uh, he, he um, made a point that the size of these patches, as we have shown, does not differ very much from place to place, is comparable to, to the size of the diameter of the dendritic trees. And he thinks that's an optimal way to mix information. Namely, if you if you if you have a dendrite being completely within that patch, he gets a lot of information from this patch. If you have it sitting at the border of the patch, you get a mixture of patch input and interpatch input, and uh, and so on. So. Um, yeah, so he thinks it's a, it, I think I think it's a good idea that it's a good means to, to, to have a, a, a large variety of mixtures. Now, uh, one point I forgot to say that, of course, you would be able to fill these patches, but I assume that you would need to, um, now, if you have a small brain, now, if you have a large brain, it is of course you need to bring together much more information at a given place than in a small brain. Um, and you, when you have one, want to have a good associated device, you 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 need to somehow inter you know, interdentate the many 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 inputs from many different places, uh, much more than in a small brain. And so, um, and I think that is what makes these patchy projections in particular in, in large brains. Is, is that understandable? I think I got it. In a patchy, is that a set of neurons? It's a large patchy. It's a. Yes, but it's a set of neurons. It's a it's a set of terminal fields. Terminal fields. Terminal fields. The neurons are sitting somewhere else. They send their axons to some to uh, a patch 10 millimeters away or, or 10 centimeters away, and they may may ramifications there. Uh, so such one patch gets uh, one patch gets input from uh, all all these patches get input from the same injection site. But, yeah, so if this is the, this, these are the terminal fields from neurons sitting somewhere else. Okay, could you please repeat your question? So you said, why are, why are the, the, the patch used for? So you, 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 your personal feeling is that just one single? So could you please say it again? So you can give, you give two reasons. Yeah. The second one was by Malash. And then yeah, yeah. The of the three, of three, uh, I have two reasons. He has one additional reason. <laughs> one reason that I thought uh, that you need always cooperation to get some message across. 
So if you would have uh, a very, uh, if you would, um, so, so at a given place, it does not make sense if you have just one fiber. So this is precisely, if I remember correctly, the way plants and plants explain why the belief that the random graph should be a critical aerodoshemi, they say it. If it was super critical, well, we don't succeed getting there. It was super critical to many information multiplying. If it is critical, it's fine, but we need to have many of them. So you are giving exactly the same information. Could you please comment? You know that the famous paper by Beck and Plan about the uh, uh, avalanche in, in the neo -cortex. About avalanche? Ah! Uh, it's a paper from 20 years ago, I guess. From Dietmar Plans. Yes, it was Plans. Yeah. He, he, he was a PhD student in our institute. Who plans? Both. Huh? Plans. Plans. Dietmar Plans, yeah. It, it looks like uh, very much like your point of view. But yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Ye
that it's not so that there are no synapses at all in between the patches. The, the axon goes, the, the axon, the lateral goes, let's say, to this patch, to this patch, to this patch, maybe to this patch, and makes a lot of ramifications, but it also makes synapses along its way. So um, it's not that there are no, that it's only, only, only information going from there to there, but, but more. <laughs> So, so the point is, individual neurons make patches, but neighboring neurons make also ramifications in the same patches. And when they make strong ramifications in such a patch, they have also a higher probability of having several synapses, like Audrey yesterday said, between uh, with the neurons located in such a patch. Well, there's a way of matching this picture with the picture of the synapse. The density of synapses made by neurons in these units say it's not present. So that you can say identify this box where it's not exactly a curve. No. Sorry? Is it possible to match this field with the field of the patch? Oh, can you take that? Synaptic density is, the general synaptic density is the same all over the world. There should be some synapses in between there that you can see this in these pictures. Is it possible to have a way of seeing them spot by synaptic? Uh, well, I showed you the synaptic boutons yesterday yes. along axons and if but you would... But it does have short range patches. This is for the middle range. Yeah, yeah. But also, yeah. But they mentioned that explicitly that you find also synaptic boutons between the patches. So... I don't know about the density of this. No, but it's, it's much less dense in any case. You, it's much less dense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I am now, yeah, that was it for today. <laughs>